So our next speaker is David Rosenberg. David is a serial inventor and entrepreneur. He is the CEO of and founder of Aero Farms, a pioneer in indoor farming located in that well-known agricultural hotbed of Newark, New Jersey. He will speak to us today about how vertical farming is revolutionizing food production and, comb and combating global food insecurity. Thanks, Amy. Amy asked me where I was from. I said, Newark, of course. The, um, so most people here, you look at this room, we're in a conference room, a conference center, and you, you think that's its purpose. I look at it and I see farms. And so I lead a vertical farming company, Aero Farms, and our farms are built in rooms similar to this. And are there, there we go. So it's, the room is about this dimension. We would have multiple rooms. And if you could just have a visual, if you imagine a tunnel that's about five feet long, I'm sorry, five feet wide, 80 feet long, in ceiling heights, about 36 feet to the, uh, to the ceiling, it's, uh, we'd have a 12 to 14 levels of growing. And we grow leafy green vegetables. And, our, and we do this 365 days a year. So there's no sun, no soil, and this is a, a growing trend of local food production. So what I'll do with you now is share some of the tensions, some of the macro tensions in terms of food production, food security, as well as some of the technological opportunities that are coming. So on the tensions first, we have massive population growth, by some estimates, we need 50% more food by the year 2050. Coupled with that, we have massive, drought, massive water, water shortages. We grow leafy greens. In leafy greens, they're grown in the salad bowl of the United States, which is called uh, Salinas, San Joaquin, in Northern California. About 90% of our leafy greens, and when I say leafy greens, think spinach, kale, arugula. And it changes, obviously, by crop, but most of these are grown in in the, in the Northern California area. So here, there are tremendous droughts. I'm sure we've, a lot of us have read about it. And it's not just droughts and diverting water from the Colorado River, but we're digging deeper and deeper ground wells, taking water from future generations. And it takes much more time to replenish that water than it does uh, the rate that we're using it. Equally, uh, on the top right, we're trying to illustrate water contamination. So 60% of our water contamination comes from agriculture in general. And water usage, about 60% of our water usage goes to agriculture. So I, I was inspired to get on this journey in agriculture from an interest in water. And it became clear if you want to solve the world's water problems, solve agriculture, where most of the water is used. Another tension is the world's lost a third of its arable land, that's like farmland, in the last 40 years, coupled with tensions and again, food, popula population growth. These are m massive problems and it speaks to how we need a new paradigm of how we're gonna feed our planet. Food, food spoilage is another huge issue. In, in the category we address, leafy greens, according to USDA, there's almost 70% food spoilage after product comes off the farm. And this speaks to the development of the cold chain. It also speaks to production consolidation and where the mouths are. So in, in highly perishable products like leafy greens, it on average has a 10-day shelf life. So you could envision the tension of taking product off the farm, getting it to the cities, and having people eat it before it goes bad. And I'm sure we've all experienced buying product and it gets slimy and then you end up throwing it away. So food spoilage is a huge problem. And, and you could imagine this issue gets worse in poorer countries where the cold chain isn't as developed. This sort of product, you need to harvest it and then you need to get it in a refrigerated space and, and keep that cold chain all the way to the customer. Food contamination, in, in the area of leafy greens, there's 11% of all food contamination is in this segment. It's a huge problem and, and we're, as, as we move to more and more industrial agriculture, and actually you have this trend whether it's 
household farmers or industrial agriculture, we're putting more chemicals on our foods, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and more fertilizers. People don't think about what, when you, when you buy something and it says triple washed, we don't think about what that means. But if you go and you see what the first wash looks like, it looks like milky, a milky white residue. And that's the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides that you're washing off. The second wash, it's a little less milky white. The third wash, it's a little less. But there's a lot of residue uh, still on, those, on that product. So what we, in, in, in the washing, that's where one has a, where a micro contamination becomes a macro contamination. So while it's important to get those materials off, it's also a big point of vulnerability from a sense of spreading a contamination. So here, urban agriculture, a lot of it's following the trend of local manufacturing. And from a city perspective, since a lot of us, a lot of people in the audience are developers, there is, on one hand, greater and greater economies of scale in manufacturing. On the other hand, there's a movement with local production, not just farming, but whether it's 3D printing or laser printing or a lot of uh, increases of computing power, you see trends of manufacturing locally pop up in a, in a lot of areas, and there is a lot of excitement in, in some segments. Uh, one of those is highly perishable foods. So I'll, I'll talk about something we're doing, and I'll, I'm going to try to uh, give this a real estate development slant. So here, uh, we're building our ninth facility, which is on the bottom. This is a repurposed steel factory in, in Newark, of course. And here are some of the other ones above that. We built a, a farm. Uh, it's now our research and development farm in an old nightclub. We joke that the plants are literally on the dance floor. And, and people joke around of how music influences plants, and we'll talk about light and music, whether it's strobe lights, disco lights, or other specific spectrum could influence lights. Uh, we have another farm in a paintball facility, and here's this one in a steel factory. So a lot of what we're trying to do is repurpose urban areas. I'll share that it's often harder to, uh, to do this than to start from bottom-up construction because just the legacy craziness of a building could, could make it harder to navigate around. And, and the environmental conditions are really important. So just numbers, we're able to get 130 times the productivity over a field farmer. Meaning if a field farmer could produce a pound of product in a square foot, square meter, we could get 130 times that. And we do that uh, several ways. One is, we, um, going back, we, our crop turns are every 16 days. So in 16 days, we could seed and harvest versus uh, about 30 days in the field. And doing that 365 days a year affords us uh, 22 crop turns a year on average versus three because of seasonality. And then we also have this vertical nature of 12 to 14 levels high, as well as a lot of crop density in, in the way we grow. Uh, we do that using 95% less water. So remember I started off saying how 60% of our fresh water goes to agriculture. And we developed a way of growing without pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. So we don't have that triple wash and it doesn't have to, and it's ready to eat without being washed. And to share where science comes in is if most pests, most green leaves aren't green, they, they reflect green spectrum. So understanding what spectrum both optimizes photosynthesis as well as what spectrum could be altered to make it hard for the pests to see the leaves. And the, the pests often look in green spectrum. So there are some fun ways we could get around, uh, away with uh, some harmful chemicals without, uh, without we'll get, get to the objective of using those chemicals, like pest resistance, without using the chemicals. It's, it's very data-centric, the way we grow at Aero Farms. So we take a lot of data points about, a, on, we grow on these trays that are five foot by three feet, and we take about 120,000 data points from seed to harvest. And, and that's important because uh, to grow, and, and I'm going into some detail, there's a trend in local food production, and I, I keynoted at the uh, Urban Agriculture Conference this year, and I shared that I thought about 90% of the players are gonna go out of business in the next three years. So we get a lot of interest uh, to go into different cities, and we're a platform partner 
from the Rockefeller Foundation, 100 Resilient Cities, to help cities identify opportunities for urban agriculture, as well as what the landmines are uh, and questions to ask. And, and here, what I share is you need four things for, uh, to grow well. And, and one of the challenges that I found is uh, biology is tricky. So the plants all, don't always do what you want them to do. So the words we use at Arrow Farms is we listen to the plants very carefully. And they're not speaking, but there are a lot of signals that they do send. So we need to be really good at the plant biology. So when we talk about those 120,000 data points, it's understanding what the plant wants, when they want it, how they want it, and the whole conversation of nature versus nurture. Like what makes you, you, me, me? Is it our genetics or is it the environment? That conversation exists in plants. Here, we don't meddle with the genetics. It's non-GMO, but on the nurture side, it's what the plants want to eat. And just like if you eat differently, sleep differently, exercise differently, it changes your biochemistry. Here, we could change the plant's phytochemistry by getting it to eat differently, sleep differently, exercise differently. And we sense what they want, different varieties, and we give it to them. And, and it's the opportunity to understand plant biology in controlled settings that isn't the case in the field. And, in, and the dynamics indoors is very different from the field, and that's why this is important. The environment is very important, and it's the environment that, the plant, that most plants want is similar as in this room. And understanding how that matches with biology and operations, uh, we have about 120 standard operating procedures, most of which are around food safety. And then there's also a mechanical, how the lights and the pumps and all that go together. And the economies of scale matter. So it's important to, to every farm should have a food safety professional. And the economies of scale, are, of scale matter in processing equipment, automation and seeding, harvesting, cleaning, packaging, or some element of that. And where you don't have that, the economics don't necessarily work. So where we see a lot of farms not understanding their economics is they're going after uh, $20 or high, high yield, uh, high, high price products like microgreens and um, herbs, where, which are lower volumes instead of going after big volume areas to get economies of scale of automation as well as food safety. So a small farm that's just a cluster of chairs, if you have to hire a food safety professional to manage that farm, it's easy to quickly understand why the economics don't work. So big is important, but cities can develop resiliency and food security within their cities by going big, but it's very hard to do it with lots of little farms. Like anything else, people does matter. And in here from a, like there's a lot of curiosity of what are the jobs of the future. Here, local manufacturing, whether it's food or something else, there's some wonderful opportunities and business plans that come from this. It's also exciting, there are tensions. One of the other tensions in farming has to do with the future farmers. It's a lot of kids go into like their parents' trade in farming, but less children of farmers are going into their parents' jo um, track, job track of farming. And, and now, with this trend of local food manufacturing, we are seeing a flood of resumes of people that are excited about the emotional connection with food and this idea of local food production. And, it's, um, and, and there's some great people and, some, and, and the descriptions of, like the, of, the, of the kind of people that we're hiring is not intuitive to farming. It's a lot of data scientists because the data is so important, mechanical engineers or engineers of different disciplines, but the sciences is a big part of this. And there's also uh, opportunities for unskilled workers. On the... Um, on the micro or, or the, the hyper-local side, we, we put a farm, this is uh, Michelle Obama visiting a farm we put in in a school where we put a farm in about the size of a quarter of this, this uh, platform, the stage, and it feeds a school of uh, 200 kids, K through eighth grade. And it's great to have the kids interact with the food because it's building eating habits of leafy greens where Typically, these kids were eating the fries and they weren't trying the food, uh, growing product like chervil. And here at Aero Farms, we've grown about 300 different varieties, so trying to bring heirloom varieties back into the mix. Uh, chervil has a 
like a licorice taste. That was our Trojan horse, if you will, of getting the kids to eat this stuff. And there's opportunities, whether it's building farms in buildings, uh, the tension is, has to do with like food safety and how it gets managed. So there is a lot of investment dollars at Aero Farms and others of monitoring these systems, but it's not just monitoring, it has to do with like cleaning the systems and making sure that they're really being accounted for. So there's a lot of complexity that's coming together. It's a new industry, and, um, but there's a lot of opportunities. From a real estate standpoint, we're, our, our ninth facility is backed by Goldman Sachs and Prudential, which is good in the sense of, for a new industry, seeing the economics of our previous farm and getting comfortable to provide debt, uh, senior debt, at, at this farm is a, is a sign that the trends are going in the right direction. And we talked about repurposing areas. And here the ceiling heights matter because you want to be able to not just spread out the cost of real estate to as, uh, as much revenue as possible, but also uh, spread out the cost of the HVAC. The HVAC is often the biggest part of the tenant improvements. Here's some images of these different farms. The, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in the space, a lot of media. This is one of the projects that we built in, um, in Newark, which, which looks like a, a typical warehouse construction. So it, it is, whether it's insulated panels of certain dimensions, of certain uh, insulation on the cooling side, on the refrigeration side, the tenant improvements typically cost about 10% of the building. Here are some dimensions of what we see a typical commercial farm, we want to look at uh, at least 70,000 square feet, uh, 36 foot high ceiling heights. Electricity is one of the hardest parts because uh, getting all of it's the 12 to 14 levels of lights, so getting all the electricity into, uh, into a building is sometimes that's the, the hardest part to find of a building. Uh, and, and here I'll say on the electricity side, there's a lot of engineering going down to reduce the energy load. So we, we look at what spectrum optimizes photosynthesis and what doesn't. So for example, yellow spectrum is the energy hog of spectrum. And it doesn't necessarily, it isn't the most useful spectrum from a photosynthesis standpoint, so we strip it away. And we literally go through all the colors of the rainbow, giving the plants more of what they want, and in that sense, lowering the energy footprint. We've worked in brownfields as well as uh, depressed areas. An average project is about 25 million on, on this scale, and that includes uh, purchasing of the land and uh, some of the building costs as well, certainly the tenant improvements. And, and these are modular, so they could go up and down, uh, big or small, like I said, the one in the school. Where we see this going is bigger farms in, in cities that are more like uh, 300 square feet, the farms. They could, they could serve a population of about uh, like a th tier three city of a million people. That farm itself would do under 10% of the, uh, about 10% of the population in terms of feeding their annual needs of leafy greens. Uh, we're working on version 4.0, and I point that out because in this category, in this industry, the capital costs are going out down. There's something called Heitz's Law, which talks about the price of a diode getting more efficient by 50% every uh, every three years, and if you just follow that around, you see that the economics of local food production are moving in the right trend. So this is a trend, it's not a fad, and it's gonna be one of the answers to uh, food security in the future. Thank you. <laughs>